How's it going, y'all? Kevin Kuhn here from Athlete Factors. This is the Athlete Factors podcast, and I'm here with my favorite teacher and professor of all time, Dr. Darren Willoughby. How you doing, Doc? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing very, very well. Thank you so much for giving me the time. Um, I've actually mentioned you a couple times on some other podcasts just because um, when it comes to the amount that I've learned, uh, undergrad, grad school, after grad school, um, the three classes I had with you account for, I don't know, probably 90% of, of what I think I know about exercise physiology and nutritional biochemistry. So you've had a huge influence on uh, not only my academic career, but my ability to apply that to, um, you know, the, the in the trenches training and, and really just the application of that knowledge. So just wanted to start out with that. Thank you so much for, uh, for having an impact in my life. I really, you know, I really appreciate it. Well, I, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate those kind words and, you know, uh, Conversely, I appreciate I appreciated you as a student, your your commitment, your dedication, and and your diligence, uh, and and uh, your resilience to learn as much as possible. And now that you've been able to get yourself in a position to start applying that information, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. You mm-hmm. know, I can sit and talk in the classroom till I'm blue in the face about research or whatever the case may be, or more on a practical note with training athletes and non-athletes alike. And so, you know, if the information that we talk about in class is not practical and applicable, then, you know, what, what good is it really? So I, I'm, glad to know, I'm glad to know that you found it useful. So I appreciate that. Yeah, extremely useful. I mean, the amount of, of practical nutrition info that we would get in neuromuscular exercise physiology class and cardiopulmonary exercise physiology class like was way more than I learned from my nutrition classes so <laughs> and they weren't even nutrition classes that you took for me to take phys so yeah. the exercise biochem obviously that was more nutrition nutritional biochemistry exercise biochemistry kind of all wrapped up into one but still you know you can't you know regardless whether it's you know, you're talking about neuromuscular exercise phys or cardiopulmonary exercise physiology, you know, you, you point blank, you can't exercise without energy and you don't have energy without nutrition. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, it all dovetails in, uh, into each other quite nicely. So sometimes that's, sometimes that's overlooked, but, uh, you know, again, it kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the biggest issues with, uh, the, the quote-unquote practitioner of exercise physiology or kinesiology or whatever the case may be is they tend to get pigeonholed into just the training or just the nutrition and as much as possible I try not to you know get backed into either one of those corners just because you, you have to have a solid foundation of both if you want to be able to um, to get the most out of your athletes and provide the most benefit for them. So, um, yeah, that's that's why I loved your classes. We got yep. both. Well, that's true. I mean, the, you know, nutrition and training, they're not mutually exclusive, but they're actually mutually inclusive. They have to be. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because one doesn't occur without the other and vice versa. For sure. At least on an optimum level or suboptimum level in athletes, you know, or, or non-athletes, but, but high-performance training individuals. So, Mm -hmm. for sure well that's i'm always looking for not just what works but what works optimally um and so you i i try as much as possible to stay on top of things and one way i do that is to bring on guests who know what they're talking about so (laughs) i don't know i know what i'm talking about but maybe sometimes (laughs) it sounds like i do (laughs) awesome well Would you uh, give us a little bit of background about yourself, Um, kind of where you're from, uh, what you studied uh, in college and and grad school, and kind of what you've done work-wise up until now? Uh, Sure, I'll I'll try to keep it uh, short, sweet, and wrapped up in a nutshell. So, you know, (laughs) you know better than I, as well as I do, sometimes that's difficult for me. um, (laughs) I mean... I, 
I've been an athlete all my life. It still, still am, you know, to some extent and would be if, you know, if it wasn't for, uh, you know, for a, a, a bad knee that I just recent about a year ago had finally had totally, totally replaced. But, uh, you know, I, I, I played sports all through as a kid up through junior high, high school. I mean, and, uh, high school, you know, was, uh, was a multi-sport letterman, but excelled mainly in football and baseball. And then went to, uh, uh, went to college on a, uh, playing football. And so as, as an undergrad, um, you know, my, my undergrad degree was, was kinesiology, um, if you will. And, um, and back way back then I wanted to be, when I, when I finished graduated, I wanted to be a high school football coach and, mm-hmm. uh, and teach and teach science, um, mm-hmm. biology and chemistry. Cause I, I really, really enjoyed the sciences, hated math, wasn't good in math. But I really did well, and I and I really enjoyed the the, the sciences, you know, particularly biological science. And so, uh, you know, it, and then my junior year, uh, I had to take uh, anatomy and physiology, and so that that opened the door for me, particularly the physiology portion of the class, just getting an understanding how our how our body works, and um, you know, because up to that point, you know, I just I really didn't know. I mean, I I love to work out and I knew if I worked out and I really worked out hard, my body would adapt and respond. But so I finally got into a point where I started to, to begin to realize a bit why. And then I started getting even more interested in kind of exercise physiology. And of course, way back then it was exercise physiology was still a fairly new, de- uh, you know, discipline or subdiscipline, I guess, if you will, within physical education, kinesiology and mm-hmm. Um, and so, and then when I finished my bachelor's degree, I got, a, I worked as a fitness director in Dallas and in Fort Worth. Um, I'm from a very small town in Texas called Eastland. And so I went to Tarleton State University in Stephenville, Texas for my bachelor's. And as I said, then I, I, I was working as a fitness director and I did that for about a year and a half. And then I decided I wanted to go back and work on my master's. So I went back to Tarleton. And, and Tarleton's program was good, but it was it was more general. You know, it wasn't a heavy science program. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I finished there, did well, and just was even more fascinated about exercise physiology and, and nutrition because, you know, at that point I'd quit playing football in college, but, and, but I enjoyed lifting weights. And so I continued on lifting weights and started doing competitive powerlifting, but, but bodybuilding more. And I enjoyed bodybuilding more because – of the nutritional piece. I like being able to use training and nutrition as a way to kind of sculpt my physique. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of my buddies, they like to do powerlifting because they could just, you know, they go and lift and all they cared about was getting as strong as possible and they'd eat what they wanted. You know, they didn't care how they looked. And so, <laughs> you know, and so of course I did, but, but I wouldn't say not totally from a vanity perspective, but more so from trying to use the information I had learned or I knew up to that point nutritionally and training wise to, 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 to make a difference in my physique. And so, mm-hmm. so, you know, I, so I, I did that for, and then after I finished my master's degree, then I was, you know, even more, um, even more interested. And so I went to Texas A&M for my PhD. And so <clears throat> I got my PhD in, in exercise physiology, but I specialized in, uh, in, muscle physiology and biochemistry mm-hmm. and then i kind of sub specialized in neuro nutritional biochemistry and, and molecular physiology because at that point i was really 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 interested in exactly understanding how the how the body worked in, in regards to exercise not so much on the on the macro level but uh, but now more so on the micro level and even at the biochemical and molecular level so you know mm-hmm. What causes, you know, what causes genes to be turned on to 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 make new proteins and how do those new new proteins incorporate themselves in the cell mat- cell matrix and in muscle and actually start doing the, doing their jobs and 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 being able to increase muscle contractual contractile force and then increase size with training and so on and so forth or muscle power, whatever the adapt the primary adaptational stimulus is. And so anyway, and so and then after that I just I took a visiting assistant professor appointment at University of Houston in Clear Lake for a year. And then from there, I got to academia for about almost three years. I worked as a director for cardiopulmonary rehab um, right outside of Fort Worth. And I started missing academia and I went back into academia. 
as assistant professor at the University of Southern Maine in Portland, Maine. I was there for four years and started and created and directed a, a new exercise physiology lab there. And then I came back to Texas and then was uh, on faculty at, uh, at TCU, Texas Christian University. Um, and I was there for five years and, and was tenured and promoted and then was recruited to come to Baylor back in 2004. So I've been here 15 years, kind of hard to believe I've been here that long. Um, and so, you know, over the course of time with that, you know, honing my my research and my analytical skills in the in biochemistry lab, I've still continued to be um, very passionate and interested in the practical piece of training and conditioning, strength and conditioning. So, you know, when I was at Texas A&M, I worked, I volunteered and worked in the in the weight room with strength and conditioning coaches, working with athletes. Mm -hmm. When I was at the University of Southern Maine, I did I, I, I did the same thing. Um, and then when I was at TCU, I did the same thing. Uh, and then since being here at Baylor, I've done that. I've done that off and on as best I can. Mm -hmm. um, so this past semester and even now, I've been I've been hired on staff for Baylor football, where I've been working with them. We're on a nutritional as a nutritional consultant for for some of the players that we have that that uh, we really need to put weight on them or or take weight off. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I've enjoyed that. I've enjoyed that a great deal. And so I've tried to stay as close to um, as close to the practical aspect as possible and, just, and try to be as best as possible a, li a liaison between between the basic science and the practical science. And so understanding the basic science as well as I do, understanding the practical applied science as well as I do, then I feel I feel well suited that I can actually bridge that gap and actually, you know, I can be a lab scientist, but just as easily I could change careers and be a strength and conditioning coach as well. Mm -hmm. So that helps me be able to, you know, use what I've learned and my knowledge from the lab and my research to better funnel that into what I teach you guys in the classroom uh, or what I taught you guys and what I teach in the classroom that you can actually use and apply to your clients on a practical level. Because like I said earlier, if you can't, it, you know, you can take all that information, but if it, it ends up knowing, not being practical and applied, then again, what good, what good is it? You know, it needs to be translational. We need to be able to make it work and make an impact and different and a difference in, in somebody's life. So anyway, so there you go. Awesome. Sweet. Well, uh, that, that's kind of a perfect segue into um, a couple of things I wanted to cover. So uh, I guess first and foremost, I mean, I'm seeing a ton of stuff on like Instagram and Facebook now about how, you know, like uh, this, it's this false dichotomy where calories don't matter. It's all about hormones, right? So it's like you got to pick one or the other. And it's funny because I wrote a book back in 2013 about how you can affect your metabolism by by addressing uh, or by eating specific foods at specific times, training specific ways to take advantage of your hormones. But then earlier this year, I wrote a book about how important it is to view calories like currency for your body and you have to set up a budget. You have to know how much you need in order for, um, for long-term, uh, maintainable, sustainable changes to be made. So, um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, about, I guess that dichotomy, are calories dead and, uh, <laughs> and what's the importance of knowing your caloric need for, for an athlete? Yeah, that, that's actually that's actually kind of a good lead, lead in question, uh, and it opens it opens several doors. Um, one is that uh, calories absolutely matter. Uh, hypocalorism <laughs> a hypocalorism doesn't allow us to do much of anything performance wise, particularly optimum performance um, in the in the scope of adaptation over time with training. The other thing is, is that nutrition, calories, nutrition, uh, and let's say whether the, we, we're consistently hypercaloric or hypocaloric, will uh, will impact various hormones as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for instance, if somebody stays hypocaloric, significantly hypocaloric on a very low calorie diet, 
that generates a stress response. And so those individuals are going to find themselves dealing with elevated levels of cortisol, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we know that obviously carbohydrate intake impacts insulin levels. We know that the lack thereof impacts glucagon levels. We also know that, that you know, a stress response ongoing just generates uh, increases in catecholamine um, responses, adrenaline, you know, particularly that uh, that will help in fuel mobilization, which, and that's the other thing, a lot of these hormones that we talked about, that's, their role is for um, substrate mobilization. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, insulin, we have substrate mobilization from the standpoint of, of, uh, of uh, helping to move uh, or facilitating the process of, of carbohydrate uptake into, into muscle, um, particularly. Um, and then, of course, uh, adipose tissue as well, if we're taking in too much of it. Um, <laughs> Glucagon facilitates, you know, obviously liver, uh, liver glycogen breakdown, liver glycogenolysis, but also gluconeogenesis as well. If we're utilizing protein for a fuel source, which we don't, hopefully we don't, we're not doing. <laughs> and then you've got issues of, uh, like I said, epinephrine stimulates uh, glycogen breakdown, not only in liver, but in skeletal muscle as well. And in, in adipose fat tissue, it stimulates upregulation of hormone synthesis of lipase or the process of lipolysis where we're actually um, unesterifying triglycerides so that the body can use those fatty acids for fuel. So, you know, I use that in a roundabout way to say that that calories make a huge difference and calories impact hormones. And, you know, uh, the lack of calories impact hormones, the, the abundance of calories impact hormones as well. Um, and so, again, it's one of these things where you can't, you know, you can't, you can't really have one without the other. Of mm -hmm. course, there are a, a number of hormones that are metabolic, non or pseudo metabolic or metabolic that may or may not be affected as, as significantly, you know, that you can have the, you know, orexigenic or anorexigenic hormones, leptin, ghrelin, obviously help drive either the, 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 the sensation to feed or the sensation not to feed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, those are all, those are impacted by other hormones as well. So, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of like a, a Pandora's box, if you will, or it's kind of like um, a grab bag, so to speak, it, it, from the standpoint of some of them work collectively together, some of them don't. But again, they're all impacted by, by calories in one way or another, either too much or just enough or not enough. So, gotcha. So that, that's, I guess the the trigger or the issue that I see related to, to to that these posts online where people talk about not being able to lose weight while being in a calorie deficit and so that's why they don't believe in calories anymore or being unable to gain weight while they're in a calorie surplus and that's why they don't think calories work anymore and I'm just like well obviously the way you're measuring your whether you're in a calorie surplus or calorie deficit is not accurate or you're not giving it enough time or uh, maybe you're expending more calories than you think you are or maybe you're not expending as many calories as you think you are. So actually you're, that uh, that last statement you said, I, I find because I do I do kind of as a side business, I do nutritional consultations myself and and uh, and, you know, why? <laughs> why? You know, what we see many times is that it's, it's just related to if people don't, if they, people think they're in a calorie deficit and they're not losing weight, usually they're not in a calorie deficit <laughs> or they're not in enough of a calorie deficit because one, mm. they're, they're, they're not, they're not estimating caloric intake correctly. They're not, you know, if they're doing food logs or recording their food, for instance, they're not, they're not being honest or accurate mm -hmm. uh, and it may not be it may not be that they're being purposefully dishonest. They're just not being accurate because either they're not, they're misrepresenting their serving size or whatever the case may be. Or sometimes they're not taking into account for little snacks that they have like here or there. Well, you know what? I just, I just, you know, I just had a handful of Skittles. That's no big deal. Yeah. But you had it three or four times a day, you know, <laughs> just, just little stuff like that, which as you all know, can make a huge impact over the course of a day. So mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, and then people that were gaining weight, it's like, you know, and I say that because we've been, 
<laughs> we've been dealing with that now with some of our ball players is that, you know, okay, tell me, you know, and these guys, you know, they have, you know, they have to eat. They have to report and eat three times a day, but, and they do. But then when you take a look at it, you know, they report in that they're eating dinner, but when you go over there and check it out, they're eating a bowl of cereal. Mm. You know, so it's little stuff like that where, you know, again, it could be what they're eating in addition to, you know, how much, but, but at the end of the day, it's, 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 it's all, you know, this, it's, it's all about calories. Mm -hmm. No, are you taking in too many or are you taking in too little? And, you know, and I'm not talking, you know, and it's not talking about just one day here and there, we're talking about consistently over the course of time, Mm -hmm. you know, so over the course of a week on average, are you hypocaloric or not? All right. Sometimes we have days where one day you're slightly hypocaloric the next day, you may be eucaloric or slightly over the next day. You're way hypocaloric because you had, you know, somebody had a couple of, you know, long meetings during the day at work and they weren't able to eat enough. It, mm-hmm. it, you know, it waxes and wanes. So over the course of the week, what's that average caloric intake that you need relative to your to your total daily energy expenditure? And if it f- falls way below, then again, it's all about it's all about um the energy intake and the same thing goes with with uh with with weight gain you know it's like Mm -hmm. are you truly eating enough calories all right and of course with weight gain and you know this obviously with weight loss or when i say fat loss versus say muscle gain if a person is wanting to gain weight primarily through muscle and not through fat gain as well but you know, this pro and both processes eat processes take time, but with muscle gain, obviously they can exacerbate that with resistance training mm-hmm. rather than just sitting around and just eating excess calories. They can eat excess calories, but if they're not pushing the muscle, increase the process of, of protein synthesis, then any gain any weight that they gain is probably primarily probably going to be more fat than it is muscle. Mm-hmm. Because the body's not being stimulated to increase its rate of, of muscle protein synthesis. So anyway. So that that's my take, you know what? And I and I, I I listen and I see posts and you know and particularly for my and I'm I'm going to give him a little bit of a shout out here to for my 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 very good friend and respected colleague and that's Dr. Lane Norton and he posts a lot about this. You know, mm-hmm. guys, you, you know, you're either eating enough or you're not. Period. You know. Yep. You can scream about hormones all you want. You know, and I'm you know my carbs and my insulin or you know. Yeah, it's either too few or 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 or, uh, or too mu- too many. You know, either way. At the end of the day, it's all about how many calories have you taken in. Period. Yeah, it's one of those that it cracks me up that people like to talk about how um, like nutrient timing is so important for for these anabolic hormones and and u- utilizing certain nutrients within the training window and how important that is. Yeah, that's really important, but it's not more important than knowing you're get enough you're getting enough calories like absolutely so at the end of the day like yeah you if you're like i i always bring it back to like the budget analogy like you can make a ton of money all at one all at all in one time let's say but if it's still not enough to cover all your bills then you're still in debt absolutely so if you want to be able to save for a trip to Disney World, you have to know what your budget is, you have to know how much you're making, and then you have to be able to set some aside so that you can afford that adaptation. Yeah, um, that's, that's actually a very good analogy. I, I, li- I like that, you know. It's, uh, and then, you know, again, if you do, you know, if you do get in a, a large amount of money at, at one time, for instance, then you alluded to this, then how do you – how do you budget that over over time to be able to to make it work as long as possible? You know, mm-hmm. it's kind of like, you know, it's like, are you going to are you going to eat all your calories in one meal, all your daily calories in one meal? You're going to space them out over the course of the day. You know, there are those that would say, well, it doesn't matter. You know, and there are some studies that kind of suggest that it really it doesn't matter. Meal frequency really doesn't matter that much. It's at the end of the day, it's how many calories you've taken in. Well, that would probably be more fitting for people who are untrained or not training. I shouldn't mm-hmm. say who are not training, who are sedentary. 
-hmm. But for people like, you know, for people who are training and training intensely, then they would, they would, um, they would be much better served if they had more frequent meals throughout the day that constituted their overall caloric intake, um, uh, respectively. So, you know, so like you said, the nutrient timing window and all that, you know, and meal frequency that, that ends up being important stuff. But, but, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I, I was just talking to a, a, a young, a, a young gentleman just a couple of weeks ago who was, you know, he was, you know, he was talking to me and he was get he was giving me that giving me the song. He was hitting all the sweet notes, you know, about my, you know, nutrient timing and, and this, that and the other and, and the amount of protein he was taking in. But then when we started when I started pushing him a little bit, you know, he was he was hitting all those notes right. But at the but it, but but what happened is that the final note at the end of the song, meaning at the end of the day, he wasn't taking in enough calories. So I'm like, you know what? You can nutrient time all you want, but dude, you're not taking in enough calories. So I'm sorry. You're not going to be putting on any size. Yep. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, you're in debt. <laughs> exactly. Nothing's yeah, you're, going into savings. You're hypochloric. You're in debt. And, you know, you're, you're, you're not taking in enough calories, particularly if you're doing heavy, heavy resistance training, for instance. You're mm -hmm. not taking in, in, in enough calories to do a number of things, but specifically to meet the needs for uh, elevated muscle protein synthesis, mm -hmm. because it costs energy. You know, mm -hmm. we use ATP to make new proteins. Um, and so if those pro if those, uh, uh, if that energy is not there by way of caloric intake, then the process of muscle protein synthesis is going to be significantly hindered. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I struggle, so, well, I don't necessarily struggle with this. My athletes tend to struggle with this because a lot of them are endurance athletes. And so trying to convince them to not just eat until they're full, but to know what their calorie needs are and then hit them because it's not enough to just, like you said, fuel for the training session. Do you want, do you want to have enough fuel on the front end so that you can apply a potent training stimulus that your body can then adapt from or adapt to. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a whole lot more involved than just, oh, well, you know, I had a decent run or I had a decent bike ride or I had a decent swim. Like, if you're going into that session with a gas tank half empty, then now you've got a huge hill to climb just to get to the point where you're refueled for the next training session, let alone being able to adapt to that training session. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. And then, you know, another thing I use a, the example with that's, that's related to that is, you know, is what do you do in your post-exercise recovery, uh, recovery period nutrition wise? Uh, because a lot of times people, whether it's endurance, resistance, uh, exercise, a lot of times, you know, they're thinking about nutrient timing or that, that anabolic window, you know, or the, the, you know, the window that's uh, where that's the most, um, you know, the most receptive for glycogen replenishment and that type of thing. So a lot of times they're thinking along the lines of one or maybe two meals, you know, the, the first hour, maybe two to three hours after training. And then that, they don't think beyond that. Mm -hmm. And so I tell them, I said, you know what, the time, the time when you, you, you cease your training session on that day to the time when you start your training on the on the following day mm -hmm. that's your post exercise recovery period mm -hmm. don't think about it is my pre exercise me because you know you can think about it that way but it's still post exercise and so you have to be thinking and applying strategy meticulously throughout that entire post exercise recovery period to do exactly what you just indicated to get your gas tank or yourself metabolically ready for the next training session so that you don't come in in a deficit particularly if you're talking about carbohydrates and an endurance individual if you're talking I lost you there for a second can you go back maybe two three thoughts <laughs> sorry about uh, that man you know me i, I, I don't I have no clue where that was um, let's say maybe I was just saying that, you know, the post exercise recovery period extends from the time when you stop exercising on yes. one day until the point when you start exercising on the next day. And yeah. so, you know, 
sometimes people think about post-exercise nutrition as one or two meals after their exercise session where they should be thinking about it all the way through, even up to maybe their their their, their pre-bedtime meal or their pre-bedtime snack, and then their meal when they, when they first arrive and all the way up. And, and again, that it's going to vary based on when somebody trains. Is it early in the day or is it middle day or is it, you know, is it later in the day? But there, But that being said is that of course, endurance athletes are primarily going to be most concerned about carbs, but they also need to also be um, concerned about protein intake as well, because mm -hmm. those individuals need more protein than what they usually think they do anyway. And of course, we know that through research, you know that better than anybody else. <laughs> and so with resistance training people, it's not so much about our, our carbohydrate level. I mean, that's important, but you know, if you're talking about an hour and a half of intense training, you know, we're going to use a relatively small amount of, of muscle glycogen as opposed to somebody who's doing endurance training. Mm -hmm. Our issue is more related to muscle protein synthesis if the goal is putting on muscle. Mm -hmm. um, because we know from studies that, you know, one single bout of resistance exercise will elevate muscle protein synthesis for up to 12, 24 hours mm -hmm. and perhaps longer. Just that's one bout of exercise. So we know that our exercise session stimulates muscle protein synthesis. So why can we not augment that through nutrition? Because we know that research has been very, very clear that we can augment that through nutrition, um, uh, through you know our caloric intake, whether it's carbohydrates, whether it's protein, particularly protein, but still to be able to um, take advantage of that, that uh, more robustly open uh, nutrient timing window, if you will, because when it comes to protein, we don't, I mean, the term, the term, uh, you know, nutrient timing window, uh, you know, window of feeding, however one wants to look at it relative to protein, there, it's, there's not one that we've been able to, that we've been able to define. With carbs, we know that, you know, the longer you wait after, the less receptive this muscle is going to be able to resynthesize glycogen. We know that, all right? Mm -hmm. But with protein, we don't know that. So, mm -hmm. you know, we just simply know that after exercise, that providing providing protein will help augment muscle protein synthesis. So, we again, we don't know whether that, is that taking it in right after or an hour after or two hours after. We don't really know. Mm -hmm. But like you, I'm sure, I mean, I just typically will recommend people, well, since we don't really know, then it would probably behoove you to just go ahead and start taking in protein as quickly as you can after your after your exercise bout. Mm -hmm. You know, why you know why throw chance to the wind? Let's just let's just go ahead and start doing it now and continue to follow that out until the next day when you hit the gym. You know, or or yeah. if you, you know you hit the track or you hit the the cycle or the pool or whatever the case may be. Because you know protein intake applies very, very similar to both the endurance athletes and, res and resistance training athletes. It's, there's really no difference. The only primary difference is the amount. Other than that, the process is the same because endurance athletes have elevated levels of muscle protein synthesis. That, that's, I mean, that is for sure. Endurance athletes needs for muscle protein synthesis or to support, uh, to support the synthesis of proteins that are involved in aerobic oxidative related metabolism so oxidative enzymes and so on and so forth that are involved in in the muscle operating oxidatively to use oxygen more effectively and more efficiently to make atp for energy mm -hmm. right resistance training it's it's that's not the case it's proteins to, that are used to substantiate the muscle fibers to increase muscle force and in in, in addition to that then they increase in size you know, with endurance training, that's not necessarily the case in terms of size because there's not the, the, the heavy force um, capacity that has to be dealt with. But it's more of an issue of, of um, using protein as a way to support protein synthesis for those oxidative protein related components. So and a lot of times people don't understand that, but it, it's, mm -hmm. it's just as critical. Protein intake in endurance athletes is no less important than it is in, in meatheads. It's just not. So thank you so much for saying that, because that's uh, <laughs> that's one that I have to that's an idea that I have to combat relatively consistently, just because, like you said, the idea is, OK, well, if you're not trying to grow your muscle, then why would you need more protein? 
and like my the most common answer that I provide is, uh, are you not damaging your muscles when you train? Like You're doing that for sure, right? So whether it's from squatting, deadlifting, or running a marathon or training for a marathon, there's a lot of muscle damage going on. So you've got to have enough to repair the damaged tissue, and then you, it's probably not going to hurt to to have a little bit extra so that you can. Um, so that you can prevent the excessive breakdown of muscle tissue and so that you're not tapping into stored muscle tissue as a source of fuel. This, like, the, the class when this topic came up absolutely blew my mind when we were talking about, uh, specifically about taking in a bolus of branch chain amino acids, you know, uh, before a, an endurance bout, just so that you're, you're kind of, preventing the body from having to tap into stored muscle, um, you know, utilizing cortisol to break down muscle tissue, to send it yep. to the liver, to make sugar. Um, that blew my mind because I was like, man, nobody out here that I've ever heard of has ever said anything about, you know, maintaining the size or quality or efficiency of the engine with regards to endurance training. It's all just put gas in the tank. And so that was, that was huge for me. I was like, Oh my goodness, this is amazing. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> that, and you're, exa you're, you're exactly right. Because, you know, if you think about it with a lot of endurance athletes, depending on what, you know, what their primary type of training is, whether it's marathon, whether it's triathlon, whatever the case may be, if it's, you know, if it's something that is of, of, appreciable duration and then based on their training and how much volume they're putting in during the week the issue and the problem with that is as you remember because we talked about in class is that a lot of times those individuals it is very 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 difficult for those individuals to get in enough calories but mm -hmm. the other thing is if i can back up a bit and that's during during the training session itself based on what their training sessions like um you know, much less their actual event, if you're talking about a marathon, triathlon, or a triathlon or whatever. But, mm -hmm. you know, you're talking about the body not being able to meet metabolically the, the demands of that, potentially that training session through, for instance, just carbohydrate. Well, not going to from carbohydrate, in the, uh, depending on the duration of it. But then not so much just from fat, because then the, the, the body will also utilize protein is a fuel source it, it, it really doesn't have much choice mm -hmm. because you know as cortisol is released during that that type of and we know that exercise resistance exercise has a very very minor impact on cortisol and the cortisol is it levels de decrease or are or attenuated within about 30 minutes after the exercise session so it, it has no impact on muscle atrophy, muscle pre protein breakdown at all, okay? Mm -hmm. if people get freaked out about that. Oh, my God, you know, my cortisol levels are increased when I, you know, when I work out doing resistance training. Okay, big deal. It, has no, <laughs> it does it because it's the body's way of trying to mute, mo mobilize it for potential substrate utilization, but it's not needed for that. Mm -hmm. Well, in endurance training, we know different because, you know, it's finding a way to be able to substantiate energy demand over that long longer course of training cortisol mm -hmm. levels elevate they stay elevated we know from the literature that cortisol levels can just be significantly elevated there's data show at the end of a triathlon i mean a marathons it it is just it is way up there yeah. and the reason it's way up there as a stress response is to be able to mobilize substrate and that substrate is protein breaks it down, as you said, and uses it as a fuel source. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if that's the case, and that's also perhaps occurring with training through the week, then what you said is totally on point. Elevate your protein intake to be able to minimize protein breakdown as much as possible. You know, I, I use it, and you remember this in class, I use this example all the time. Very, very, very serious, well-conditioned endurance athletes, what do they look like? Are they all muscular and, and jacked and stacked? No, they're not. Because remember what I said, what endurance training is, is what? Is it anabolic or catabolic? It's it is a catabolic. catabolic scenario. Yeah. By and large, resistance mm -hmm. training is an anabolic scenario. Catabolic is not. 
because they're using large amounts of fuel. So, and part of that is muscle being used for fuel. So you have to be able to, as you said, to be able to counteract that as best as possible. And relative to muscle protein breakdown, the best way to do that is increase protein intake on a daily basis to help minimize muscle protein breakdown. And like what you're doing with some of them, I can see, is it doing some amount of low to moderate intensity resistance training just a little bit during the week can have a huge impact on maintaining muscle mass as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, what I found is that dealing with nutrition wise, dealing with endurance athletes is way more difficult <laughs> than with meatheads. Meatheads, which I'm one of them, we're pretty, sim- we're pretty simple. Just give us more protein and we're good, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but with endurance athletes, that's that's not the case. They're, I mean, those 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 people are, I mean, you know, they, they can be pretty tricky based on what type and of training they're doing and volume of training. Mm-hmm. It's just it can be it can as you well know it can be very tricky. So, yeah, yeah. it's uh, I have to prioritize things for sure when it comes to not only my endurance athletes, but athletes in general, you know, I have to make sure first and foremost, they're, they're eating in a way that they can adhere to long-term then, you know, they're hitting their calorie goal. And if they miss it within a 24 hour window, then we just zoom out and we make it a 72 hour window or a week window just so that, you know, like it doesn't have to be perfect every single 24 hour day. Like we've, there's flexibility here. And then from there, um, in general, I, I try to work them up to one gram of protein per pound of body weight, yep. uh, re- regardless of, of the, the activity that they're training for, whether it's, you know, a high school basketball player or a track athlete or, you know, somebody who's training for an Ironman. Um, if they can tolerate more and they want more and they understand the value, then shoot, it's not going to it's not going to hurt to go over. No. Um, for, so could you just jump in a little bit, uh, right here and talk about like, is that an appropriate amount of protein? Um, what's the research say currently about, um, you know, what amount is optimal? What amount is, uh, what amount is effective? What amount is optimal? I guess. Um, actually, <laughs> that's a good question. And that <laughs> right now is, 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 um, you know, it's 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 a bit of a source of controversy right now. But in my mind, particularly, you know, you read on social media. It for me, it's a it's a significant source of humor because I read some of this stuff and I'm like, seriously. So you know, but um, so to answer your question, is one gram per pound? That's for most people. That's plenty. You know, that's that's a good amount of protein. The other thing is I wanted to kind of interject here is that a lot of times people, and and this is probably more so with um, like in, in physique competition, for instance, like bodybuilders and, you know, classic standard figure, you know, and it's just something that's kind of transformed over time. But I know it can extend into, into other uh, avenues as well uh, around uh, in sports. And so, you know, not that bodybuilding is a sport and not that we're athletes per se, because there's a lot of controversy there as well. But nevertheless, you know, uh, that's, uh, you know, I'm not addressing that to try to start up a controversy, but, you, you know, you, you get my drift. <laughs> but um, but the issue here is that a lot of times people think throughout the course of the day, based on my meal frequency, how many times I'm eating a day, sometimes, and I deal with this a lot, people think, you know, particularly in physique competition, because I do a lot of physique uh, prepping, um mm-hmm. and, uh, coaching is that they you know they they come to me and they think they ha- they have to eat the same amount of protein at every meal okay mm. i got it whatever that is and of course now it you know and i'll get into here in a minute about you know how much protein the body can use at one time and all that type of stuff but anyway they think okay i gotta have every meal i gotta have the same amount of protein and let's say 30 grams okay gotta have 30 grams or, you know, uh, or at least 30 grams to be able to round out whatever it is I need over the course of the day. Well, you know what? That's not that's not true. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not saying that if you don't do that, that it's not a bad thing. That's that's fine. But so, you know, if you have a meal here and there where you're off, you're under. Or you're over. 
it's not a big deal. You know, the, it, the, it, what matters is at the end of the day, have you taken in an adequate amount of protein? It doesn't matter. Did you take in X amount of adequate amount of protein at meal one, two, three, four, because the body doesn't use it that quickly to make proteins. It's not like you, it, it uses the protein and amino acids from the protein in the meal in one, in a, in one hour, an hour and a half. It's already, it's already been using it to make all these new proteins. No, it doesn't happen that quickly. So, you know, if somebody, if somebody hits their, tar their protein target with meal one, and then they miss it with meal two, and then they miss it with meal three, but then they, but then they hit it at meal four, and then at meal five, then they go over and above, so that over the course of the day, they've still hit their, their protein target for the day. That's all that matters. Mm. It's not about eating the same amount of protein. And there's some really, really nice studies that, that suggest that to be the case. It's, mm. it's, it's, it's about daily protein intake rather than how much are you taking in at each meal. Gotcha. And then based on, you know, the big thing right now is, is um, you know, how much protein should somebody be taking in at a time relative to how much protein, the, you know, the body can utilize at one time. The answer mm -hmm. to that is we don't know, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> you know, there's a, you know, a study that was done, a very nice study a few years ago that, that suggested that, you know, 20 grams of, uh, of protein was... Uh, was just as good as 40 grams of protein at stimulating muscle protein synthesis after one bout of resistance exercise in untrained men, all right? So after that, it was like, okay, so it's 20 grams. 20 grams, you know, you don't need 40 grams or, you know, so that, that range of in there, 20 to 40 grams, you know. And then from the same laboratory, they came out and, and replicated the study, um, although the first study they used albumin and the second study they used whey, but protein quality is the same, so it don't matter. And then they used resistance trained individuals. And in this particular case, they found that 40 grams was more effective than 20 grams. Mm -hmm. And so now all of a sudden the push is, okay, well, every meal we need to get in 40 grams of protein, at least 40 grams of protein. <laughs> but, you know, and now, you know, and I, I've even seen at conferences and I even, I even politely called a guy out at a conference that was giving a talk on this saying that 40 grams was the protein ceiling kept going upon that's the protein ceiling that's the protein ceiling meaning that's the most that you know you know and i finally i stood up at the end i'm like how do you know that mm. what if this study would have used 50 grams 60 grams 70 grams yeah we don't know there's there's not really been any studies it's similar enough in this regard to suggest that so all we're going all is based on a study that showed 40 but what if that study would have shown 50 to be better or 60 to be better. So you, we can, we don't know the answer to that, you know? Yeah. But we do know that, you know, a lot of times the thought is the more protein you eat, the better off it is relative to being able to induce, exacerbate increases in muscle protein synthesis. That's kind of a line of thinking, particularly with meatheads. It's like eat as much protein as you can and, you know, and it's going to make you help make you even bigger. That's not true. All right. It's not true because, you know, Philip Atherton came up with several years ago with some very elaborate uh, research studies that he did where with, you know, amino acid intake, particularly with leucine, but amino acid intake, and he, and he, he found something and substantiated a term called the muscle full, muscle full, F-U-L-L, -L, full effect. Mm -hmm. And he showed that, that giving amino acids, and we'll just say leucine, for instance, is you increase the dose of, amino, of, of um, amino acids, then uh, let's say leucine, then you increase muscle protein synthesis, but only up to a certain amount. And then the muscle becomes fully saturated and then mu and protein synthesis doesn't continue to elevate even though you continue to increase the dose mm. of leucine. The mm -hmm. muscle is full. It's, got, it's saturated and it can't synthesize any more protein over and above that particular level. And so that's called the muscle full effect. Interestingly enough is we don't really know what level that is, particularly as it translates into amino acid concentrations in muscle. Mm -hmm. You know, translating protein load that we take in versus mm -hmm. is those digestion and those amino acids are liberated in plasma and then taken up into muscle. We don't, 
we don't know. We haven't been able to translate that, and we don't really know what the appropriate amino acid dose is as well if somebody is giving themselves just, say, BCAAs, for instance. Mm -hmm. So and it's, I would suspect that it's, there's probably a difference between varying individuals. Like in mm -hmm. the two studies that came out of, you know, um, my, uh, my colleague Stu Phillips's lab, did outstanding studies, um, you know, based on based on that information, it gives us a template to understand how, you know, how protein dosing can impact protein synthesis. But at the same time, you know, we don't, and how it can vary based on whether somebody is untrained or trained. His first study showed untrained 20 to 40, 20 to 40 grams of protein elicited the same effect. Mm -hmm. Then we repl somewhat replicated the study, showed that in trained individuals, 40 grams was more. Mm -hmm. So there's something likely going on with the training, uh, you know, with the training process that, that, is, that is requiring the body to have more protein to induce a greater amount of muscle protein synthesis. But again, the point at which we know that where the muscle full effect occurs, we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that, you know, one gram per pound is not is is a good amount of protein to give but in all likelihood in most individuals it's not going to be enough to induce a muscle full effect if you were giving like two and a half to three times that amount then yeah i mean really nobody okay. needs that much protein yeah i mean yeah. I'm, I'm sorry but <laughs> that i mean that's a that's a hell of a lot of protein and you know you know chan it's, you just, know, it's not palatable for most people. They just can't no, eat that no, much. No, no. Well, you know, interestingly enough, you know, my dear friend and colleague, you know, Dr. Jose Anta Antonio did a couple of cool studies. Yeah, I was going to bring that it's, up. It's funny because he, but about a year and a half before the Steve did the study, he and I were always going back and forth about this, it, this, this, this concept. You know, I finally said, dude, just do a study. Well, he did a study. And so, you know, where he was given four, you know, four and a half grams per kg of protein. Now, I think that was something like 1,200 calories of protein over and above what they were already taking in. And so it had no, and they were resistance trained, it had no effect. No on, negative health outcomes, right? Do what? No negative health outcomes either, no, which was no, pretty amazing. No, had no impact on body composition either, which, you know, which is the issue that you remember that, you know, when I would talk about in bio, exercise biochem about, you know, Eating uh, eating lar large amounts of protein is not really going to have any any significant impact on increasing adiposity or body fat levels. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the hormonal milieu just doesn't add up for that. You know, so it just it just uh, it just doesn't it just for somebody to say it does it makes is counterintuitive because biochemically the hormonal process again it it does it just it doesn't coincide for that to even be realistic possibility but he showed again no impact on anabolism over and above the the control diet which i think was 1.8 grams per kg mm -hmm. um, which is very close to the your one gram per pound right and, and you know and then and then he followed that up you know with uh, another one that he did i think three and a half grams per kg and he showed the exact same exact same um, impact. So again, that's a perfect example of the muscle full effect. You're taking in tons of protein, but nothing, nothing, nothing over and above a, a, a kind of a control diet, which is still a higher protein diet. Right. It had no, no, it had no preferential effect. And why? The muscle full effect. Saturating muscle with, with, with amino acids that the body, the body can't use to make new protein. So at that point, Pure and simple. At that point, when you've reached this this muscle full effect, um, and there's no more anabolic benefit, is there at least additional anti-catabolic benefit? Mm, I guess it, potentially that being the case, but you know, if if somebody's got higher amounts higher amounts of protein, amino acids in their blood, then then they need they're at this muscle full effect, and so they're not you know they're not taking in they're not clearing any more amino acids per se, or they've got all these amino acids in muscle that are not being utilized, then those amino acids will likely find themselves just being released, um, you know, back into circulation where they're going to be taken up into the liver and just simply degraded. Um, they're not going to be used by 
gluconeogenesis to make glucose, you know, for fuel, mm -hmm. like we would in a hypo hypocaloric state, or say during endurance exercise, because the hormones aren't there, aren't there for that to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, gluconeogenesis turns on, turns on, um, I mean, uh, uh, um, um, glucagon turns on and uh, gluconeogenesis, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 uh, um, and so that being said, cortisol breaks down muscle protein to liberate amino acids into the blood, which are taken up by the liver, and then glucagon, which is, you know, obviously elevated in, in response to low carbohydrate, is going to be taken, taking up, um, is going to be instigating gluconeogenesis to make sugar. Well, remember, wh what, what, have a, what do a good amount of the essential amino acids do to insulin? They, they increase they an insulin. Increase it. So yeah. how can you have increased glucagon when you've got a high protein load, particularly if somebody's <laughs> eating carbohydrates on top of it? Yeah. So that's that's again how if that's the case, then mm -hmm. how can somebody get fat by eating too much protein? Because the only way that can occur is if gluconeogenesis were being upregulated to significant extent and using all those extra amino acids to make a lot of glucose. Mm -hmm. that the body is not really needing at a time, so it's being cleared by the adipose tissue and being committed to de novo lipogenesis to make fatty acid and triglyceride. You, so you following me? Yeah. It's, to it's totally counterintuitive. It makes no sense to suggest, you know, unless somebody was just eating tons of excess protein, which yeah. people are not going to eat that much protein. So, yeah, that's know, it, it just, it just, it, 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 uh, it, it don't hold water. I'm sorry. It just don't yeah. hold water. You know, I think this I, year, I, I'd, I'd love Lane to be on here with me because he, he would be in a much more uh, colorful way <laughs> saying the exact same thing. <laughs> this right here, I think, is is the crux of the whole calories don't matter argument, because anytime it's brought up, it's it's always this comparison. Well, if you eat a thousand extra calories of protein versus a thousand extra calories of carbs or fat, look what happens. Like you don't gain any weight on this extra protein. And it's like, well, but the thermic effect of protein comes into yes. play. And then exactly what you just said, like, uh, it, it, I'm going to have to go back and re-listen to that to make sure I, I understand completely what you're saying. Like I understand the, uh, the overarching idea where like, like you said, the hormonal milieu just it it essentially kind of cancels it, each other out, sort of like where nothing's being stored, and and even though there's this potential substrate. Well, and and actually, you you brought up a good point that I wanted to kind of just just uh, just piggyback on, and that is is that you know eating if you eat excess protein, to the point where the body's just having to break to break it down and metabolize it. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, of course, it metabolizes, the liver breaks, you know, you go through transamination, deamination, the liver, you make urea that's kicked out into the blood, picked up by the kidneys, and then you just pee that out, you know, because mm -hmm. you have all this urea that you got to release in the kidney. So you've got, you know, but but that, but simply, so you've got the process of, of breaking down and ridding your body of, of excess protein that way, all right? Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned earlier, that is an energy, that's an energy requiring process. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you said kind of the thermic effect of, of, ex, of excess protein intake. You know, you've, you've kind of heard the term when people eat, you know, like at the holidays, you sit around and eat all this turkey and you get, you have the term meat, the meat sweats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get that. I get that every time I go to Texas Bay, Brazil, or throw the chow in these Brazilian <laughs> steak houses. Because I I'm all carnival and I will just you know and after I'm just like literally I'm just like whoa you know I feel that, like that core body up. Yeah. well you know I, I've eaten way too much protein and so my body is is metabolizing that to get rid of it and it and it and it 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 takes energy to do that so you get this thermic effect from excess protein intake not that it's going to my adipose but it's going out it's you know. Liver's breaking it down, kidneys are releasing it. Of course, then you get the whole controversy. Well, you know, eating too much protein is bad on your liver and bad on your kidneys. There's really no, there's really Where's no, the data, there's, the data is not there. Okay. Yeah. 
Now, if you're talking about somebody who's like an end-stage renal disease, a kidney patient, okay, I get it, you know. But if you're talking about somebody that's got, got you know, healthy liver, healthy kidneys, I mean, no. You know, it, it, you know, it, it doesn't, uh, it's, like you said, where's the data? The data is not there. Mm-hmm. It, at least in a non-clinical setting, the data is, is just not there. So, you know. Yeah, if there's a pre-existing liver or kidney issue, then... Maybe. But yeah, then, you know, an extra protein load might put a bit more uh, metabolic stress on those two organs uh-huh. so that it could provide a, uh, a potentially detrimental uh, impact. But, you know, in, in your, you know, in your healthy, you know, your healthy people that you're training with, you know, healthy organ function, not, it's not going to make a difference, you know, or it certainly shouldn't make a difference. So, but, you know, then again, you come to the point where people, you know, most people, they shouldn't be eating that much protein anyway, you know, so you're one, one and a half grams per, ca- per, per pound. That, that's, that, that should be enough for, for, rid of, for really for just about anybody, mm-hmm. whether you're endurance uh, trained individuals or you meatheads, it should still be about good enough for just about anybody. Gotcha. So, Perfect. I mean, I, I mean that's, that's a good amount of protein. If you think about one gram per pound, Okay, you know, you talk about somebody who weighs 250 pounds, that's 250 grams of protein. That's a lot that's of protein, lot. brother. That's, yeah, a, that's lot a lot of protein. You know, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's a lot of chicken breasts. <laughs> to the point yeah. where I don't know about you, but I, I get I get tired, and I'm all carnivore, but I get, I get tired of eating that much chicken throughout the day or whatever my protein source is, so... Mm-hmm. You know, now if I go to, it's like I said, if I go to one of these Brazilian steakhouses, I'll eat all that in one meal. <laughs> I'll fast all day long if I know that I'm going, because like I said, it's all about protein intake over the course of the day. I'll fast all day long so that I can just eat as much as much as possible. <laughs> That's every year on my birthday, which it's uh, 15 days away. Well, every year on my birthday, I go to Texas Day Brazil. That's and my favorite. I, I don't eat breakfast. I don't eat lunch, and I, I just, I get my protein. Yeah, for sure. So I'll go in. I'll make us. I'll make myself just a little bit of salad, just to tell myself that I that I've had some veggies. Which for me, all that all that is is garnish. It's kind of like parsley on a plate. It's just garnish on a plate, you know. And then, and then I'll set it aside, and then you know, then I turn the thing over to green, and it's like bring it on. <laughs> it's go time. Yeah, I probably have like. It, Three or ugly. four bowls of their lobster bisque. Like oh, I yeah. can't. Oh, I cannot get enough of that. But ev- everything else is just straight. Yeah, meat. my wife. Uh, my wife Vicky. That's probably one of our favorite restaurants. She absolutely. She goes bananas for their lobster bisque, and, and she loves her salad bar. But, but you know, she's she's all carnivore by like me. But she's like you. She'll eat. You know, she'll eat at least two bowls of the lobster bisque, and you know, and so, and then the salad bar. She's got all the salmon and the, you know, the stuff on there as well. And so, oh, yeah. you know, but uh, yeah, I, I want the the chicken stuff's good, but I want, uh, yeah, I want the fillet. You know, I want, I want the, I want the the red meat. I want the, mm. yeah. So yeah, now you got me. Yeah, now you got me really hungry. <laughs> <thinking about that. laughs> <Save yourself. laughs> That reminds me of another topic that I would love to quickly discuss if you have the time. Sure. And that is, uh, is red meat really bad for you? Do we need to avoid it? Because no. why not? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, you know, I mean, you're talking about, you know, red meat is a bit higher in saturated fat than some of your other, you know, your protein sources. But if you're getting, you know, again, if you're getting a leaner cut of red meat and you, you know, you're, you're need to be somewhat concerned about saturated fat, then so be it. Red meat is chock full of, uh, of B vitamins, which are good, which some of the other, which the, the poultry meat, meats are not. Mm-hmm. So, but you know what, again, you can talk about red meat from a variety of sources and some people say, well, you know, it's higher in fat and higher in calories. Well, so be it. At the end of the day, it's all about calories anyway. Right. I yeah, mean, just so, account for it. Just account for it. I mean, yeah. what, what's the big deal, you know? Yeah. So you get more fat, then you just there don't you eat as much fat at another meal. You just adjust. That, I think right. uh, I was actually having this conversation yesterday with uh uh, kid in medical school who wanted to to discuss this and he was saying like he doesn't eat any red meat because all the research indicates 
that red meat causes cardiovascular disease and increased risk of cancer. And yeah, and I'm just like, what do those studies actually say? And they're all uh, dietary recall studies and the way that they're determining a, um, what do they call it? Um, a serving of red meat, like the, the range on what they consider red meat is just, it's pretty ridiculous. Like yeah. a slice of pizza with two pieces of pepperoni on it from like the gas station, that's considered red meat. And then like, you know, a four ounce grass fed filet, that's also a serving of red meat. And we're going to say that that's the same thing. Like, uh, there's, there's obvious weaknesses with this study. So you're, you're not, you're, you're not comparing an apple to an apple by any stretch, right. you know? So, yeah, so you're exactly on point. Yeah, you can't, I mean, you know, and, and that's that's based on, primarily that's based on saturated fat intake, which we obviously know has a link to cardiovascular disease, but that's, it's saturated fat. You, you know, what, what about fried chicken? You know, if you're particularly, you know, if you're talking about fried chicken now that's used, you know, that's deep fried with, you know, with vegetable oil, well, then that's a little bit of a difference. But, you know, I grew up in a time, because I'm old enough, I grew up in a time almost everything that we ate was deep fried was from lard. Mm. I mean, so saturated fat, you know, whether it was fried <laughs> chicken, whether it was bacon, whatever. I mean, you know, my grandmother had, had a lard jar right mm. on the side of, her, of, of, the, uh, of the stove. And she would just, you know, at room temp, it was just solid. And she would take <laughs> a big spoon and throw it in this iron skillet. You know, and that's why over time, everything that we had tasted like fried chicken, whether it was <laughs> eggs or whatever. Because when she got done and the, and, the, and the lard was obviously liquid form, she had poured it right back in the lard jar. Nice. You know? Of course, I mean, I mean that, that's some good old-fashioned Southern, Southern cooking right there. Oh, yeah. That's what I grew up on. But, you know, so, but again, to get back on point, I mean, you know, it's, Saturated fat, yes, there's there's kind of this somewhat documented link to increasing the risk in, in for cardiovascular disease and in and, and certain type of cancers. But you know, it's not it's not it's it's primarily based on that and its ability for atherogenesis or plaque formation. It's not the red meat itself, it's just mm -hmm. the fact that red meat ha contains that. So, you know, but then you're talking about eating, you know, leaner cuts that have, you know, less amount of saturated fat, then, you know, then, then so be it, you know, like you said, you just moderate because you can, if somebody can, they can eat other foods in, in throughout the day that aren't red meat related and, and take in way more saturated fat than they might get from a six ounce sirloin steak. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it, it's just, yeah, it's, that stuff is, uh, yeah, that stuff is kind of funny. Yeah. Uh, the, Are those, the, different things that you hear. Yeah. Are those studies also taking into account calorie need and whether these people are in a calorie surplus and whether they're active? No. Like there's all these other things that are, that are probably way more significant. Well, and the other thing is, and that's another good point, Kevin, is that some of these studies they do are more epidemiologic types of studies. Yeah. It's like, it's like kind of like correlational studies. Okay, so how much red meat do you typically eat in a, you know, uh, every day or over the course of a week? And they get that type of information, and then they put all that in. It's like, okay, well, you know, these people, they ate more red meat in their diet, and, 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 and as a result, the, the incidence rate of cardiovascular disease or cancer was higher. So immediately it has to be the red meat. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and you're right. They don't take into account uh, exercise and all that different types of stuff. Cause you know, you know, as well as I do, it, cardiovascular endurance oriented exercise, the benefits it has on, on, on HDL profiles, and that can actually combat that process. So that might mean the person can get away with eating more red meat because their type of exercise they're doing makes them more conducive to per, perhaps counteracting that atherogenic effect based on their HDL to LDL ratio. It's, it's, it's kind of it's 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 kind of smoke and mirrors, right? With some of those studies, you know, and it's how people interpret some of those studies, you know, or how those studies are interpreted and then presented in mass media. That's a big problem uh -huh. that I found it also. So, so kind of related to that, 
specifically about fat and saturated fat is this idea that um, a low fat diet is is ideal, right? So for the longest time, like when when the good old fashioned food guide pyramid was was you know that was like the staple. That's what everyone was supposed to follow. You know, super low fat diet, less than you know, fifteen to ten to fifteen percent of your total calories coming from fat, and as little as possible coming from saturated fat sources. How does that affect your hormones, specifically your sex hormones, and then your ability to then repair and adapt? So you know, um, well, first of all, real quick, we know is that. You know, we found out that the, you know, back, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, you know, with weight loss, uh, that was a big push, you know, low fat, fat free, low fat diets. Well, so they're recommended low fat in the diet, but they weren't, they weren't even touching carbs. So you can eat, you know, you can eat lots of carbs, just make sure that you have, you know, you have a low fat diet, you know, and, but what, what people, what, you know, what we started seeing is that people kept getting fatter and fatter. And so now we begin to realize it's not fat, it's, it's, it's excess intake of carbohydrate. That's what's making, primarily making people fat, you know, or a fatter. Um, and so, um, over their calorie needs, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, um, uh, yes, they're just, they're eating, they're, they're overeating calories primarily via carbohydrate calories. So, you know, so we see that, you know, we see that being the case, but then, uh, and then related to what you're talking about, about testosterone, I mean, we know that. Um, you know, saturated fat intake, for instance, relative to some of the hormones, you know, it, it's hard to, you know, it's, it's hard to pinpoint, is it, is it actually saturated fat, for instance, or is it perhaps maybe the consequence of high saturated fat intakes that might impact testosterone? And this is where I'm going with this. So we know, for instance, in men that overweightness or obesity causes a decrease, it causes hypogonadism. So it decreases testosterone levels. So, you know, but what is it that's causing the obesity? Is it, is it inactivity? Is it overeating, overeating and activity? Is it primarily overeating coming from high amounts of saturated fat or whatever the case may be? It's hard. So it's hard to pinpoint whether it's high intake of saturated fat versus anything else. But, you know, you have to instead look at, at the potential outcome of high intake of saturated fat or just high calories as, that contributes to overweightness in men that drives testosterone because it, it blunts the testosterone axis. Um, so, you know, I guess I'm not dodging the question, but that, that question is a little bit hard to answer if you're looking at it to a specific macronutrient, you know, um, it, because again, I think it's more related to the outcome more so than the individual macronutrient itself, if gotcha. that makes any sense. Yeah. So, yeah. um, related to that, is there, is there a range of, uh, not necessarily saturated fat, but just fat in general in your diet that's going to produce, uh, good or optimal outcomes with regards to the production and efficacy of your sex hormones? Well, we know, I mean, obviously, you know, testosterone, your sex hormones, I mean, they're, they're, you know, they have a cholesterol moiety associated with them. So they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're lipid based hormones. Um, and so, you know, we know that that being said is that, um, you know, as they're synthesized endogenously, they, the synthesis of them, let's say, t whether it's testosterone, estradiol, which is the primary estrogenic hormone, they start with cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, and so from that, then, you know, a high, you know, a high fat diet, you know, if that fat is able to be broken down in, in the cholesterol used from that, then, you know, it, it could it could play a role in maybe perhaps but that's where you get, an, again, an, a, perhaps there's an optimum level of fat intake that might impact cholesterol levels to be able to help boost or optimize testosterone production. Uh, what that level might be, I'm not, I'm not aware. Um, mm -hmm. But again, then you get to the point where, you know, high amounts of fat intake, if it ends up triggering overweightness, obesity, then it's actually going to blunt the axis. 
Gotcha. So again, you know, based on the fact that, you know, that the fat, saturated fat, fat in general, the cholesterol used from these guys can be used to, to you know, to promote uh, cholesterol. So if you think about it from the standpoint of if if the testosterone axis is blunted, or well, let me let me back up. So you know, you've got if you're creating too much testosterone and the body is using, then of course it aromatizes to estrogen. Mm. So you can look at it from that from that regard. Or if the testosterone axis is blunted, then it could be blunted in a way that it affects the testosterone estradiol ratio. So somebody in a in a male, for instance, becomes more estrogen dominant, which wouldn't really be a real good thing. Um, and so you know, but the same the same issue outcome could could come with females. But now we're looking more relative to estradiol, not so much with testosterone. So you know, because they're more they're physiologically they're more estrogen dominant than we are we're more testosterone dominant than them but we know that mm -hmm. that they that they you know their their endogenous synthesis pathways are somewhat interrelated as well mm -hmm. particularly in the adrenal gland so you know uh you know where testosterone in in you know in, in females the majority of it is synthesized comes in the adrenal gland where in the males it comes from obviously in the testes so mm -hmm. But still, you know, uh, those pathways are, 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 as I said, are interrelated. So anyway, so gotcha. on that one, that's, you know, not knowing that literature any more than I, I do, that's that's probably the best I could give you without mm -hmm. without sticking my head into the literature <laughs> and just seeing wh what's out there and what's kind of kind of recent. So gotcha. So the reason I ask, I'm just uh, I'm I'd like you to kind of critique the way that I uh, generally uh, program uh, fat calories uh, for some of my clients. So um, after I, you know, kind of assess what I, what I, or predict their caloric need, their maintenance level of calories, and then, you know, one gram of protein per pound of body weight, um, I found quite a bit of data showing that if you go less than 20% of your total calories from fat, that can have a negative effect on testosterone production. So um, I've seen a lot of people say, you know, 25 to 30% of maintenance level calories is usually pretty good. So that's, that's typically where I go right around there. Um, so do you think that's pretty safe? Yeah, I would say so, and I, and it all that all comes back to what I was talking about earlier is that, you know, is if you cut cut fat out, cut fat dramatically, then you know then you can potentially have an impact on the amount of cholesterol that the body is receiving nutritionally to be able to use to synthesize testosterone or other sex hormones endogenously, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so um, and. Um, you know, even though the body makes its own cholesterol in the liver through the HMG CoA reductase pathway, you know, still we can, you know, we can provide cholesterol from our diet that can also be of assistance with horm with hormone, you know, lipid hormone production. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just sex hormones, but cortisol and other lipid based hormones as well. But in this particular case, particularly the sex hormones as well. So, um, you know, so, you know, I. I, you know, I, I, I would go along with that. I mean, I, I think that, and on the grand scheme of things, I mean, we need, we need fat in our diet. So trying mm -hmm. to go zero fat, whether it's, you know, saturated or unsaturated, of course we want more unsaturated than saturated, but we need fat in our diet. Fat is good. Our body needs it, you know, mm -hmm. unfortunately, whether it's, you know, the same thing with carbohydrate, but unfortunately in our society, we, you know, we're, we don't moderate very well. <laughs> Particularly when it comes to nutrition and diet, we just don't moderate very well. And so, you know, it's, uh, you know, you can't stop with just maybe two pieces of pizza. You got to have six or eight, you know. Yeah. Um, Moderation so, isn't sexy. No, no. Well, well, <laughs> well, it's, it's hard to sell. It, moderation. It, it, it's it, yeah, it, uh, it, it certainly is. What's that old saying? I, um, uh, what you what you. Um, let's see what you, what you eat behind closed doors, you wear in public. Mm, wow. 
So, you know, so if that, and if that regard, then I don't know, you know, it, that might be sexy. I don't know. <laughs> uh, wearing, uh, wearing excess pizza. I don't know. So yeah, I, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just leave that. I'll just leave that out there, you know? So, uh, but anyway, like I said, I mean, you know, we need, we need fat in our diet. So some amount of fat is good and, and also critical. So, mm -hmm. and, and I, you know what, I would say, I would say that, that, that 20% based on your macro count, I mean, that, that's, that should be fine. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I mean, that's, that's a, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a good amount for anyone. So, yeah. And especially as, as my clients tend to be in a calorie deficit, I figure having a little extra fat can't hurt. Nope. Nope. So. Not, no, because, you know, you can, it's easy, it's easier to make up calories with fat than it is mm -hmm. with protein or carbs. Mm -hmm. you know, so for sure. And also based on the fact that in some cases, foods that are a bit more, um, fat concentrated, then, you know, you can, you can do it even more so with less amount of food, uh, as mm -hmm. well that with a far higher fat content. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, your client may not necessarily like it because you know you know they don't want just a small amount they want a more robust amount but you know, <laughs> what are you gonna do <laughs> well, can't make everybody happy all the time no 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 in the end they're gonna do what they want to do anyway so you, you set them out on this diet here and then they come back and you know it's it's funny sometimes with my prep you know for physique uh, competitions that you know my athletes are, are my competitors again i'm not sure whether they're athletes or not but you know some people would agree or disagree but i'll just say my my clients you know they'll just well you know i i'm tracking their progress and it's just not you know happening and i'm like you know and i know they're cheating on their diet you know <laughs> I, I i know i don't look like the sharpest uh, knife in the drawer but you know i'm not that dull and so you know i'm like okay you know I know what I know what you're on works. I mean, I you know it's scientifically sound. It it, mm -hmm. it works and it and it will work if you're not cheating on your diet. You know, so yeah, that's when I was kind of alluding to the fact that you know you can you can set them all up and have them on a great plan, but you know at the end of the day, it's all about them. You know, are they gonna are they gonna stick to it? You know, again, the old saying you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Right, that's you know? true. You know, you can, you can set them up on course, but they got, but they have to do it themselves. You yeah, know, you they've got to own it. You can't do Yeah. You can't do it for them. I can't do it for them. And I, I tell them that you're right. You got to own it, you know? And so, um, so yeah, anyway. Gotcha. Well, this has been so amazing, doc. Uh, thank you so much. Um, oh, I wanted to give you a little time just to plug, uh, your new gym in Waco. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh yeah, sure. So we've got, um, you know, of course my, my day, my day job is, uh, you know, I'm a professor of exercise, uh, uh, and nutritional biochemistry at Baylor university. And I've been there for 15 years. And so that's my day job. And then on the side, I, I, am a co-owner of, of, uh, peak to perform, um, which is a, a, a sport nutrition and a supplement, um, store. So, you know, I always kind of had two gyms being a meathead. I was, you know, I said I'd be cool to own my own supplement store and my own gym. And so I, I do that now. So I don't own them outright. I, I'm a co-owner. So uh, so I co-own Peak to Perform here in Waco. And then I also own, um, co-own, I'm sorry, I co-own um, with, uh, uh, with uh, Josh Barrett. He's, uh, he's a, a Baylor alumni and he's also a competitive bodybuilder as well. And just a super, super good, good, good dude. And so, um, I co-own it with, uh, and it's something we've been working towards for quite a long time. He and I, and my wife, Vicki. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, but anyway, it's, uh, it's a personal training gym and, uh, it's, it's called lab. Um, uh, it's uh, fitting. Yeah, the lab, uh, fitness and wellness services, but just the lab. And so, you know, we like that name because we use it as a way, of course, you know, it, Josh kind of, he's the one that brought up, he goes, let's name it the lab. He goes, you know, you're a scientist and, you know, you work in the lab, but he said also we can use this as, as, as a lab and a way of transforming people's lives. And so mm -hmm. I said, you know what, I, I like that, you know. And so anyway, so it's called the lab. It's here in Waco and we've been open for now for about, soft soft softly open for about three weeks but we have our grand opening uh, on saturday 
Awesome. Um, yeah. So, uh, and so we're, you know, that's kind of like our, our coming out, if you will, even though we've already got, I don't know, we've got four or five trainers that are contracted with us and, you know, and we have two massage therapists that are contracted with us. And we have a, uh, a guy who's contracted with us who, who does body composition now. He owns, he owns a bod pod. And so, you know, uh, and then Josh and Vicky, they, you know, they're personal trainers and they have their own clients that they train there as well. Mm. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, Josh and my wife, Vicki, um, they, they pretty much run it. You know, I, I have a day job that keeps me very, very, very busy. So, you know, but it, we've been busy the last up to this point, just getting everything uh, up and going, getting it all buttoned up. And, and just in terms of all the things that we want to have, um, um uh, have ready for the grand opening and so so we'll be we've got that so i, I i'm teaching summer school right now so I, you know i finished and then i went today and then i got in a quick workout and then i did a little bit of work there and then i came home so that we could do the podcast with you and so tomorrow the same when i get teaching then i'll run over work out then again i got i got three little things that i want to do before saturday so you know and uh yeah, so after Saturday, then the, hopefully the chaos will begin to dissipate a bit. But, you know, it's uh, yeah, it's it's been fun, and it's it's been one of those things that we've been we've been praying for for a long time, particularly Vicky and I, and also Josh, and you know, as a way to kind of use it as a ministry to be able to impact people's lives in a in a positive way, both through their emotional health and their physical health, because mm -hmm. those are oftentimes tied. You know, a lot of times people struggle emotionally. Their emotional health, you know, they struggle because it's linked to their physical health. They're overweight. Mm -hmm. uh, they're inactive. They're overweight, maybe. And because of that, they don't feel good. They don't feel good. You know, it's messed up here. or They don't like the way they look. You know, it mm -hmm. affects their emotional health. So, you know, we can use that a way to improve their physical health. And then from that, then, then hopefully that translates into them feeling better about themselves. And as a result, it has an overall positive impact on their quality of life. You know, and so, and like I said, you know, in our ministry way, you know, if they people have a better, uh, a better uh, view of themselves, uh, then then hopefully they can understand that. Then at that point, that and maybe open them up so that they can uh, be more in tune with their faith. And so, you know, it, we just we just using it in that way as again as a vessel to be able to just help improve. Uh, the lives of others so you know we're not out to we're not out to get rich mm -hmm. we're out uh, you know uh we're just we're out to just help others um uh in a very very positive way so uh that's 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 what it's all about so yeah it's the name of it's called the lab and uh check us out online at the lab and mm -hmm. uh, we're also on facebook we're on Instagram at uh, at the Lab Fitness Waco, so you can kind of check us out and you know and and and, and follow us and you know and, and just give us give us support and uh, you know that's that's that'll help that'll help us moving along and so uh, we yeah we we appreciate uh, any support and same thing with you know with Peak to Perform I mean it's uh, you know I, I enjoy it because. You know, the supplements in the store are only ones I endorse, you know, as you well know, part of my expertise is nutrition supplements. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've consulted with, I don't, all, pretty much all of the major supplement companies out there and help formulate products, reformulate products. And so, again, if, the, you know, if uh, you're not going to see a product on our shelves that, that I don't endorse and I don't work with my other co-owners to say, uh, you know, this, this, not this, not this, not this, but this, this, this. And, you know, so I, I provide, you know, my other co-owners, they, um, you know, it's kind of interesting because they're in the fitness because they, they're, they both co-own train Waco, which used to be CrossFit Waco. Mm -hmm. And so I got involved with them because they called me in a few years ago to help come in and start doing some of the nutrition work for some of their CrossFitters, particularly the serious ones that were working towards trying to work towards the games. And so, mm -hmm. And so that was fun. And one of the co-owners, Brandon, I've known for a long time because he and I used to work out in the same gym together. And so that that relationship just kind of blossomed. And then and then we started talking about the store and it's like, well, you know, let's do it. They said, you know, you know, each of us has their their kind of their, you know, 
Jonathan kind of has his niche in the store and Brandon has his niche in the store. And, and then my niche primarily is just from the, the, giving the, sci the scientific substantiation to the store by virtue of all the products that we carry and being able to stand behind those and give information about the products and so on and so forth. So it's been fun. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's nice. I'm at a point in my academic, academic career. It's kind of nice to have the challenges and, and, and other diversions, if you will, so they can kind of get me out of the biochemistry lab so you know so that i'm not as much like a lab rat <laughs> as i once was you know oh, yeah. so yeah so you know i still train every day and i still compete in bodybuilding and my co competition's been a bit sidelined because i had my my knee totally replaced so i'm having to work and rehab and try to now just try to put size back on it so much i lost during that rehab process but you know mm -hmm. I'm still grinding every day, you know, and I'm trying to get as nasty as I can, you know, and moving, <laughs> moving heavy weight around. So, you know, um, yeah, I hear so, that. yeah. So, you know, you, things haven't changed any from when you were there, you know, as, as my grad student, things yeah. haven't changed much. It's just kind of the, you know, just kind of, um, just, uh, you know, just, just another day, uh, uh, just, you know, another day that, we just continue to do what we do. So, it, it blows my mind. Uh, I started in the fall of 2009, so that's yeah. 10 years ago. This year, like that, yeah. it feels like I was just there. Like, yeah, well, you know what? I was talking to somebody just the other day. It just, you know, I've been here 15 years, and it's just, and I, and I've worked with so many of you guys, masters and doctoral students. Of course, that's I primarily that's I, you know, you know, I, I primarily teach and deal with grad students, very little few undergrads, um, uh, and then run the lab and, and um but with the exception of the first two classes, particularly the first class, first two classes of doctoral students, in terms of being able to know what years they graduated, like now if if before you told me that, if you would have asked me, said, do you remember what year I graduated? I would I would say no. <laughs> because and it's nothing against you, but you got it. Just time, just it's just it just all runs together. Yeah. And I've had so many of you guys, and you guys have been so all so wonderful and awesome. But yet, I, it's hard for me to you know it's hard for me to know. I I could have given you a general idea, and I might have gotten it right, but I probably would have come within about two or three years of being right if I got it wrong. But mm -hmm. again, it's just you know there's been so many of you guys. It's just hard. I mean. I, you know, I remember each and every one of you. I'll never forget that, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, and, uh, you know, but it's awesome because like with you and so many others, you guys continue to stay in touch and you reach out and, you know, it's, it's, I really, really, really appreciate that. And what you said earlier about, you know, being, you know, your, your kind words about, you know, about, um, uh, how I've, I've helped you, uh, you know, professionally, you know, it, it means a lot. It's nice to know that, uh, you know, that, that the time that I put in and I try to, I've tried to do it as much as I can selflessly, uh, you know, is appreciated, you know, and, and not only appreciated, but it's being helpful in, in helping to impact, you know, the lives of my students. That's what it's all about. You know, I didn't get into academia because I want, I wanted to get rich because anybody knows that if you're in academics, you're not going to get rich. You know, that has but not financially, not monetarily. I've gotten rich from from being able to to interact and be blessed by students like yourself that you know that uh, that just continue to motivate me to get up and go into work each day and, and and knowing that you know I might be able to impact somebody in a positive way. That that's what it's all about, you know. Yeah. No, I I seriously appreciate it. I I don't consider uh myself done learning and so i like even though i'm not in the classroom with you like when when you post something about a study that you guys just published i'm like all right sweet here's my chance to you know i'm back in the classroom again like i'm gonna go read it so i appreciate being able to continue to learn from you and uh especially appreciate you you know coming on and answering all my questions and well i'm that makes two of us, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but that makes two of us because, I mean, I'm not darn learning either. I mean, there's so much out there to learn, you know, and when I quit learning as an academic, then I'm dead, you know, because that's when you that's when you fail to be able to provide your students with the most updated information in our field, mm -hmm. and they deserve that, you know, and there's so many pr academics that, there's, you know, they're still just, you know, 
they're still teaching stuff that they taught they were teaching 10 and 15 years ago and in the sciences like like our field you can't do that because it, it's so dynamic it's like it's like a snowball rolling downhill it just continues to pick up momentum with the new things that we learn even in nutrition and exercise sport nutrition it's baffling the new stuff that we've learned compared to like five years ago when you were in school you know it's like yeah. okay well and you got to stay up on that. You got to stay up on that because you're using that for your clients. Even though you're not in a classroom anymore, it does, still doesn't matter. You're still an academic and you still will always be an academic because you've got mm -hmm. to continue to learn and educate yourself, you know. So that's yeah. just that's just part of it, you know. So Yeah. Well, that's well, so uh, let me I mean I'm I'm always I, you know, I, I I'll always be happy and honored to come on your show. So any other awesome. times just let me know. So, Sweet. you know. Yeah, well, so, I'll I'll definitely need you back on in the future to to catch me up on all the latest and greatest things. So yeah, well, you know, anybody that's listening that's interested, you know, they can they can find me on you know on Instagram, on Facebook. They just type my name in on Facebook, and there I am. And on Instagram, I'm in you know as Doctor uh, Darren and Vicky because my wife Vicky and I share that account. Mm -hmm. You know, so much of the what we do professionally, we you know out in this realm of training, we do together, and so. Mm -hmm. So we share that account, but then um, I don't do Twitter or any of the other stuff. But then obviously people can reach out to me if they want and just send me an email through my through my Baylor account, um, Darren underscore Willoughby at Baylor.edu. You know, I'm I'm happy to entertain any questions and and uh, you know again we're all in this together. So you know for sure. Awesome. Right. Thank you again so much, and uh, everybody who's watching and listening, go follow Dr. Willoughby right now. Don't don't waste any time. So. Alrighty, we will definitely have you on again in the future. And uh, thank you so much again. Have a good evening, sir. All right, you do the same, my friend. Take care. Alrighty, y'all. Stay tuned for the next episode.